Previously in part three, we explored the rich history of the region at Lewis Canyon before navigating Big Rapids on our way to Painted Canyon. Let it go, Dan, let it go. Coming up in part four, we spend day seven exploring Painted Canyon and encounter more of the rich wildlife in the area. Then on our final day, we'll traverse Painted Canyon Rapids. He's got his saddle. The infamous Boulder Gardens and the Weir Dam before meeting Ike Billings at our extraction point. Good morning. It is day seven and we had two options for today. One was to kind of keep our pace that we've been doing. The other option and the option we're taking is to spend a full day here. We're going to kind of explore the land, enjoy this big deep pool, maybe go swimming. Then tomorrow we're just going to have to book it to get to our takeout by 2 p.m. when our ride's going to be picking us up. So our last full day of the trip, we're just going to hang out and have some fun. And tomorrow we'll just paddle home see what else is around this place that we can get into. This rock face behind our camp looks like a man's face. It's got the two eyes, the nose, and kind of his flat, grumpy mouth. That's the jaw from a javelina, one of the wild pigs out here in this region missing a tusk but you can tell that would not feel good i'm gonna keep that guy that'll be my souvenir from the pecos so here's the canyon that's the source of that waterfall we saw last night see if we can find the source find out if it's a spring or part of the river or just run off from the storms there's a bunch of tadpoles in there hey, check it out is this turkey feather she films a lot <laughs> that's a good one be a bad time to fall. This landscape is so unforgiving. This little mile hike each way. And this sun, this terrain, these plants. It's not easy. It's fun though. It's like a grown man's jungle gym out here. Or maybe always still got moves. <laughs> Once went to a doctor to have him fix my broken finger and he told me that I'm too old to be playing football. Never went back to that doctor again. Nice. It's a good story. Ow. Ow. Everything in this place hurts. <laughs> Especially that. This is a canyon wren. We've been hearing these birds the entire trip. Their uh, call kind of sounds like they're laughing. There was one right there. These are cave swallows, which build nests under overhangs by using their saliva to harden dirt that they collect, forming platforms on which to raise their young. All right, it is hot. We're thinking it's time for a swim. Cool off a little bit. Where you go out here, there's signs of death. My companions wanted to go fishing. I wanted to go at least get a couple hours in a day. It's been a fun day. But one thing I always do on a trip like this, especially in a place that's so inhospitable, is if I separate from the group, I tell them where I'm going and when I'm gonna be back. Anything could happen out here. I could break my ankle, fall down some rocks. You never know. 
I don't want them to have to worry. I don't want them to have to come looking for me and put themselves at risk unless there really is a problem. So if you're with a group and you decide to walk off or separate, be sure to let someone know where you're going and give them the time you're gonna be back. I think uh, I've had about enough of the fishing. I think I'm gonna float back. I'll tell you what, sure beats a day in the office. All right, so whenever you're planning a trip like this, one important consideration is your apparel, what you're gonna be wearing throughout the week. I personally like to wear the kayak fishing line from NRS. These are the silk weight long sleeve shirts. And then for my pants, I'm wearing the NRS guide pants. These are convertible pants, so that's perfect for a trip like this where I can wear them as long pants, stay out of the sun, keep my shins from getting burned all day on the kayak. But then as the temperatures get up there and it gets really hot, I can convert these into shorts wear them around, cool off for a little bit, and then once I feel like I'm getting some good sun on my legs, don't want to start burning, just put them right back into pants. I've been wearing this same pair of guide pants this entire trip, and despite sitting and crawling and climbing on these sharp rocks, wading through the river, they're still in perfect shape. I don't have any rips or tears or fraying fabric anywhere. Then I've got Interest's sun shield on, obviously important. I don't want to be slathering sunscreen on me all throughout the day. I put it on in the morning, and I wear this in the afternoon once that sunscreen's been wet or, or just worn off. And last, but certainly not least, one of the most important things you need to think about on any kayak fishing trip, especially in rough terrain like this, is your footwear. I'm wearing the NRS Crushes. I've actually got a wet pair for during the day when we're on the kayak, wading over these rocks, going through rapids. And then I've got a dry pair that I've been keeping in my dry bag for hiking around at night. And that's one thing I love about these shoes. They're a great water shoe. I wear them uh, without socks in the water. And then at night I can wear socks with them and they make a great hiking shoe. They're really kind of dual purpose in that way. They've got a great sole on them. They're super rugged and they don't look ridiculous. So, I mean, I could actually wear these around town and not look like a complete dork. It's good to be prepared for anything. I mean, you want to bring as little clothing as you can so you're not taking up space and weight. I've basically had three of these shirts that I've just swapped through throughout the trip and the same pair of pants the entire trip. I'm sure I'm not smelling that great, but the, uh, the apparel's definitely done its job. Dads up on that cliff. Awe dads were imported to the region from North Africa to be put on high fenced exotic hunting ranches. Over the years, some of them have escaped and they found themselves perfectly adapted to survive in this environment. Wild awe dads now roam free throughout the Pecos region. It's incredible to watch their young prance along the cliff's edge, knowing that death awaits them should they fall. He sees us. All right, guys, it's night seven, our last night here on the Lower Pecos River. It has been an incredible journey between the wildlife, the wild mustangs, the audads, the creepy crawlies we've seen, you know, between the rapids, which were numerous and fun. You know, the landscape, this place is just so vast, so enormous. There are towering cliffs, some as tall as 300 feet throughout the entire river basin. You know, it's funny, if you were to blow over this place in a helicopter, it would look like this desolate wasteland that's full of nothing but cacti and these plants that want to stick at every turn. But if you kind of slow it down, and a kayak's a perfect vessel to do that, you start to realize that this place is actually full of life and death. And it's this sort of complex ecosystem where these plants and animals have adapted so that they can survive in this inhospitable land. The fishing's been great despite the fact that really the fishing's been secondary on this trip. You know, I didn't come here to catch bass. I can catch bass anywhere. I came here to explore this land, explore this river basin. But despite that fact, the fishing's just been easy. You know, there's a great quantity of fish here. All the fish are really strong for their size. It's just been a blast to take fishing breaks here and there and get some fish in the boat along the way. You know, there's a rich history here of our ancestors, the petroglyphs that we saw, the scrapers and tools that we found along the way. 
It's just incredible to me that these things have survived for thousands of years since those people were forced to adapt and learn how to survive in this inhospitable land. And after spending a week on this river with modern luxuries, I really can't even fathom what it must have been like trying to survive in this place without any of those things. It truly speaks volumes about the type of people that originally settled this land three, four thousand years ago. And being able to kind of get a glimpse into these people's lives is really something that I've never experienced and something that I will certainly never forget. You know, when I come on these trips, I film and produce these videos not just to show off what I'm doing. My goal is to inspire or motivate you guys to get out there and do something like this. You don't have to be an expert. I am certainly not an expert. I'm just a regular dude that just decides to go for it. And with a little planning, some preparation, you can come out here and do something like this too. I truly believe that it is good for the soul to get out here and live like we used to live thousands of years ago. Get back in touch with nature, get out of your cubicle, get out of your apartment for a week and just kind of check out. Turn your cell phone off. I have not looked at my cell phone in seven days and it has been amazing. I think that's enough rambling from me. I'm going to hang out here, enjoy this sunset, and then get back to camp and make dinner. I'm going to miss this place. Definitely top three campsites of my life. This place is awesome. It's so funny when we were here on day one, we were all kind of scrambling around on all fours, just trying not to fall. And now here we are on the morning of day eight, and we're bouncing around like mountain goats or something. It's funny how quickly you can adapt to an environment like this. You can tell that this whole canyon, it's, it's super deep, super straight, with kind of straight drops on either side except right here. You can tell that this rapid here was formed by a rock slide that came off this cliff and filled up this section of this channel right here. That could have potentially happened millions of years ago and it helped shape our path and our journey through this river system. All right, Daniel, so what's the plan here? Picking out the line right now, it's a good view up from up here. We're gonna start on the left side. We're gonna run straight into the two little bowlers, keep left. Upside down heart shape, we're gonna cut left. We're gonna shoot down, trying to avoid the big boulder down in the drop. Looks pretty harmless from up here, but I was down there yesterday hopping on the rocks. It's certainly not harmless. Should be fun though. Let's get ready to hit it. Let's get. He's our head left. stuff floating by. He's got his paddle. I can't wait out in this, man. I'm gonna get...
No, it's right here. Uh. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm good. Robert, you good? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually kind of boring to the last part. So it's just a boost here. You guys go all right? Oh man, well the Pecos was not done with us yet. Bert just flipped on Waterfall Rapid. I jumped in to grab his kayak with my DSLR camera on my around my neck still. Almost went swimming with a uh, about a 700 r camera. Dodged a bullet on that one. All right, well it could have been worse. Uh, he damaged his seat mount, but we got that repaired. Just got a little bit of water in his hole, so he's gonna sponge that out. We're gonna keep going. On top of a late start, the debacle at Painted Canyon Rapids set us back. And with yesterday's relaxing day at camp, we are now miles behind schedule. Ike Billings will be picking us up at Dead Man's Canyon at 1 p.m. sharp. If we're late and he turns around, the Paddle to Lake Amistad will take us until well after dark. We'll have to double time it through non-stop rapids, strong headwinds, the infamous Boulder Gardens, and the Weir Dam. Entire deer skeleton right here. It looks like some kind of pronghorn because the uh, antlers, these, these nubs go straight back. There's a lot of different pronghorn that have been imported here from Africa uh, to be put on these exotic game ranches. These boulders are enormous. The boulder gardens are made of rocks the size of houses, and you can often see the exact place where they broke away from the cliff faces up above. All right, we've made it to the Weir Dam. This is the home stretch now. These are the first people we've seen in eight days. He was chasing like six odd dad running along the cliff. Oh, yeah. a nice the wild horse. Were, it only came up yeah. 15 feet. You okay. Know. Yeah. No, you guys, you guys were in a serious one. Yeah, we yeah. were in the fort. Yeah. So this is Joey Benton. We just ran into him and his group, and uh, some of them were actually in the Memorial Day flood three weeks before the Lane Tree flood that Dan and Burke got washed down by. Um, it wasn't quite as severe, but the river rose about 15 feet. They said they abandoned their kayaks, lost all their gear too. So three weeks apart in the same year, two floods happened. So it's a small world in this place, kind of a tight-knit community. If you run into someone on this river, typically they at least know about the Lane Tree Flood. So this is Faith here, and she's got some good taste in apparel. She's wearing some NRS crushes. She wearing, she wearing NRS crushes. I got NRS Representing, I like it. And these are officially my favorite people of all time. They gave us a beer. That hits the spot. Thanks, man. You can tell the river's starting to really widen up, and that's as we approach the lake. actually entering the start of Amistad Reservoir. Half of it's in Mexico, half's in the U.S. and this marks close to the end of our journey. Pecos River is ending, Lake Amistad is beginning, and our ride should be just a few more miles ahead. I'm gonna miss this place, but I'm ready for a shower, a cold beer, and a juicy burger. Tonight's gonna be nice. We're starting to run into people now. And there's our ride back to civilization. Man. What a journey. Thanks, sir. Nice and beer. Cheers. Here's the Pecos River High Bridge. 
When it was built in 1892, the Pecos High Bridge was the tallest railroad bridge in North America. Heraclitus once said, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. After eight days on the Pecos, we all feel like changed men. The magic of this waterway feels ancient, as if the spirits of the indigenous people still linger among the rocks and cacti. For Bert, Dan, Underbrink, and myself, the feeling it has instilled in us will not soon fade. This is a trip we will all remember for the rest of our lives. That far ridge back there, that's Mexico. And there's the truck. But for Bert and Dan, the feeling runs deeper. This river almost took everything from them two years ago. But now, two years later, Bert and Dan have finally finished what they started. Still drinking river water. <laughs> I'm saving that last now, Gina, that shit. I'll put it in the fridge. I'm gonna mix it with some whiskey. <laughs> Next time we go to the bar, I'm like, yeah, I'll take a whiskey and Pecos water. You got, you got anything? And we out!